Welcome to session four of IROC on treatment planning and plan evaluation. We estimate that this session should last approximately two hours. By the end of this session, PGY2 residents should be able to describe the role of the physician in plan generation, development, and review. Understand the components of a thorough plan evaluation using the CB-CHOP method and evaluate simple plans. Here is an outline of the session. First, we'll provide an overview of treatment planning, including plan must-haves. We'll detail the components of a plan evaluation and then provide some examples. When pursuing radiation planning, there are two goals. The first is to treat the target. The second is to avoid everything else. While that seems like a simple goal, becoming competent in radiation plan evaluation is one of the most important and challenging aspects of residency training. This is true because obligations in clinic will often preclude extended time reviewing plans, and comfort with plan review does require deliberate, systematic, and hands-on processing. In addition, everyone's busy, and your attending may review a plan without you, or review at a pace that's difficult to follow, or assume you have knowledge that you've not yet mastered. The good news is that no one expects you to be an expert immediately. So if you don't understand what you're seeing, ask your attending or your dosimetrist, or schedule a separate time to review the plan with either of them in more detail. It is easy in the medical student or resident curriculum to be passive while your attending reviews a plan and to miss key points. So ask to lead the review or gently interrupt the conversation and ask for explanations at a level that you can understand. It's important to note that creating the best radiation plan possible for a given patient is the job of the radiation oncologist. The role of the dosimetrist is to assist the physician with defining the optimal plan for the patient. Dosimetrists are not clinicians, so they cannot be expected to make decisions about what radiation exposure is clinically relevant. Therefore, your job is to provide the dosimetrist with sufficient information to generate an initial plan and then with ongoing guidance to optimize the plan for patient safety and efficacy. One of the key aspects of radiation planning is that it is a highly visual process. So plans are overlaid over the patient's CAT scan anatomy to create a three-dimensional topographic map of radiation dose, where different colors denote the amount of absorbed dose at any given location. Once contours are drawn, but before any plan is generated, there are certain steps that need to be taken. First, the radiation oncologist should set a prescription goal for the targets. They should also set dose constraints on nearby normal tissue structures that could receive radiation. Then they should prioritize the importance of meeting each target goal and normal tissue constraint and share this information with the dosimetrist. In some cases, the radiation oncologist can also suggest beam arrangements that achieve the goal that they have set out in advance of the dosimetrist planning the case. The instructions provided to the dosimetrist by the radiation oncologist can define minimum, maximum, or mean doses for any target or organ at risk. They can also define specific doses for a given volume of tissue for example, no more than 50% of the rectum should receive 50 gray. Sometimes this is written as the V50 should be less than or equal to 50%. Here is the example that we saw in your prior lecture on contouring. In this particular case, the GTV or gross tumor volume is highlighted in pink, the CTV in red, and the PTV in purple. The prescription details that the left mediastinal PTV, or purple volume, should receive 40 gray in 16 once daily fractions of 2.5 gray. In addition to detailing the prescription dose to the target, as well as the dose fractionation size and frequency, normal tissue constraints also need to be detailed. You can see for this particular case that the normal tissues are listed below and include the spinal cord, esophagus, bilateral lung, heart, and left chest wall. 
the instructions here include both maximum, mean, volumetric, and general instructions. For example, the spinal cord maximum dose should be less than 45 gray, with general instructions to the dosimetrist to avoid hot spots within the spinal cord. In addition, volumetric constraints are used for both the esophagus and the heart. For example, the heart V30, or the volume of the heart receiving 30 gray, should be less than 40%, with a mean dose of the heart to less than 26 gray. The more instructions that are provided to the dosimetrist, the easier it will be for them to initiate a plan that is in keeping with the radiation oncologist's preferences. So, for example, in addition to the numeric constraints provided on the prior slide, the radiation oncologist can tell the dosimetrist to please prioritize avoiding dose to the esophagus and lung over ensuring complete target coverage. In addition, they might try to suggest a beam arrangement. For example, please try a four-field plan with APPA fields and off-cord oblique fields to avoid dose to the left chest wall. This will allow the dosimetrist to make an initial pass of the plan that is most in keeping with the radiation oncologist's vision. So where do dose and dose constraints come from? Phase one studies are currently used to determine the maximum tolerated dose or optimal doses of efficacy and safety. And so these remain in flux, but to ensure patient safety off of a clinical trial, most physicians look to the Quantec guidelines. Quantec stands for Quantitative Analysis of Normal Tissue Effects in the Clinic. It provides guidelines about normal tissue and volume tolerance on currently available data for modern 3D radiotherapy. Here is an example of some of the Quantec guidelines. As you can see, the organs at risk are listed on the left and the type of radiation delivered to each of those organs is included, as well as the endpoint or toxicity that could be expected. The dose or dose volume parameters are also included with the rate or likelihood of the expected endpoint. Most physicians rely on the Quantec guidelines to provide some boundaries about patient safety when radiation planning is underway. However, while Quantec provides dose and toxicity guidelines for specific organs based on available data, it's only a guide to assist with safe delivery of treatment. But the benchmarks may not be appropriate for every case. And remember that the underlying goal is always to keep normal tissue exposure as low as reasonably achievable, even if Quantec indicates that a given organ could receive more safely. So once your instructions to the dosimetrist are submitted, a draft of the plan will be generated and the physician asked to review it. At that point, the physician makes suggestions for improvement and evaluates subsequent drafts until they're satisfied with the plan. Every physician will cultivate their unique manner of evaluating the plan, but it's important, independent of your specific style, to have a systematic approach to ensure that no component of the process is omitted. Each physician may adopt their own unique systematic approach for evaluating a plan, but we're providing one such method here that's simple to remember so that as you're starting to learn how to evaluate plans, you have a mnemonic that you can fall back on. This mnemonic is called CBCHOP. Each letter corresponds to a different aspect of plan review, and we'll cover one at a time. The first C in CBCHOP stands for contours. So you should make a checklist of all of the relevant contours for the case. Review the contours you've drawn, both targets and organs at risk, to ensure that all are accounted for and that all are accurate. At this point, any expansions, for example, a CTV or PTV, should also be reviewed for accuracy. Remember that a dosimetrist can only plan a case using the information they have. If something is missing, the plan could overdose or underdose an important structure. Let's look at this particular case together. So in reviewing this plan, the first question to ask is, are all of the contours accounted for in this plan? 
And if not, can you identify what's missing? You may have been able to identify that the liver has not yet been contoured on this case, even though there is dose that is entering and exiting through the structure. Now let's look at this case, a head and neck case. Are all of the contours accounted for in this plan? And if not, what do you think is missing? You may have been able to correctly identify that the spinal cord has not yet been contoured for this particular case. And given its proximity to all of the target structures, it could receive significant dose and needs to be taken into account when planning. Once you've confirmed that all of the contours are present and complete, you can then begin to examine the beams. Confirm that all of the fields avoid entry through the organs at risk and minimize excess normal tissue exposure. In doing this, you may want to look at each field through the beam's eye view to confirm that normal tissue is blocked with multi-leaf collimators or MLCs whenever possible. Let's look at this lung cancer case. For this particular case, what's wrong with the beam arrangement? To orient you, the dashed lines indicate the origin of the beam or the direction from which the beam originates. Take a moment and see if you can determine what's wrong with this particular beam arrangement. If you follow the entry point of each of these three beams, you'll see that the posterior field enters through the spinal cord, and this would cause undue exposure to a normal tissue that could be avoided by just altering the entry point by which this beam enters to treat the lung tumor. Now let's look at this same case. A fourth beam has been added to the plan, and the prior beam going through the spinal cord has been moved. What's wrong with this beam arrangement? While this may be a more subtle defect, the beam in this case enters through the opposite lung and travels through the heart. And there may be alternative beam arrangements that would better spare the opposite lung and heart from unnecessary radiation. Here's an example of looking at the beams through the beam's eye view. This is a patient who has a cancer in their base of skull. So is there anything that you notice with this beam arrangement that could be improved? When we look at this beam through the beam's eye view, we can see that the beam includes portions of the brainstem, optic chiasm, and cochlea that are highlighted in blue and green and may not be necessary to keep within the field. Using multi-leaf collimators, we can block some of this normal tissue to better protect it, even as we treat the targets in pink and purple. Looking at the beam arrangement and looking at the beams through the beam eye view may be a helpful way to make sure that you're minimizing toxicity for patients. However, some plans will use multiple beams, and this may make it difficult to see or understand where beams are entering and exiting. If so, ask your dosimetrist to turn each of the beams on and off so that you can see the arrangement more clearly. It's also important to consider how many beams are being used and whether a similar plan could be achieved with fewer beams in order to speed the treatment delivery and reduce the amount of time that the patient is lying on the treatment table. This is particularly important in palliative cases where patients may be in pain or may not be able to tolerate lying on the table for long periods of time. So let's return to the lung case that we saw earlier. What's wrong with this particular beam arrangement? This is actually an example of a successful plan where the beam entry points minimize normal tissue exposure, 
and multiple beams are used to try to decrease the amount of individual dose moving through any individual part of normal tissue. As you can see, entry points minimize exposure directly through the spinal cord and the heart, and only exit dose is exposing those normal structures, which will decrease the amount of exposure that any of those normal tissues see. No one would expect you to know that this plan is acceptable right away. It will take time and practice to recognize when a plan is satisfactory. But I hope that you can see that looking at these again and again will provide more comfort and ease with understanding when a plan is good and when it needs improvement. So once you've evaluated contours and the beams being used in the plan, the next thing that you'd like to evaluate is coverage. So evaluating coverage of the target structures with prescription dose should involve two steps. The first is looking at the graphic plan or the CAT scan image with dose overlaid. The second is to look at the dose volume histogram or DVH to review the absolute dose that's being delivered. As a reminder, the graphic plan refers to the different colors overlaid on a CAT scan and indicating different amounts of absorbed dose at a given location. Isodose lines are the names given to the lines that separate the different dose levels. Here is a representative plan of a patient receiving whole breast radiation therapy. Each of the isodose lines are depicted on the plan in different colors. With the prescription dose being 50 gray, or corresponding to 100% of the prescription dose. You can see that in the green is 105% of the prescription dose. What this means is that all of the tissue encompassed within the green isodose line corresponds to the tissue receiving 105% of the prescribed dose. In this image, where is the 100% isodose line? Here you can see that the pale yellow line pointed out with the arrow corresponds to the 100% isodose. This means that everything within that yellow line is receiving at least the prescription dose. So again, to highlight this concept, what dose does the tissue contained within the 100% isodose line receive? Everything highlighted within that loan, now highlighted in white so it's easier to see, receives at least the prescription dose, or in other words, 100% of the dose at a minimum. To ensure this concept makes sense, let's extrapolate. What dose does the tissue contained within the 70% isodose line receive. Of note, the 70% isodose line is that line highlighted in orange. Everything within the 70% isodose line receives at least 70% of the prescription dose. But again, it could receive a lot more dose too. That's why you can see that in the outline in green, those areas of tissue are receiving 105% of prescription dose. As a reminder, all of the tissue within that 105% isodose line could be receiving even more than 105%, but at a minimum, it receives 105% of the dose. It's helpful when evaluating coverage to examine the graphic plan, looking at the images not only in the axial view as we just did, but also in the sagittal and coronal view to determine the spatial distribution of dose coverage and the conformality of the isodose lines. Let's look at this case of brain radiation together. In this case, 30 gray was prescribed to the target that's highlighted in purple. But what is wrong with this plan? In this case, even though the goal was to prescribe 30 gray to the target, the target is not currently covered by the prescription dose isodose line corresponding to 30 gray, which is that in orange. Instead, it's receiving 2850. 
so the patient is not receiving adequate dose to the tumor. In contrast, you can see in this plan that coverage is appropriate to cover the entire target so that the target does receive 30 gray. While different disease sites may have different rules for treatment, a good rule of thumb is that 95% of the target should be covered by at least 95% of the intended dose. Here you can see the two plans laid side by side with the relative isodose colors highlighted. The question is, how is the coverage improved from the picture on the left to the picture on the right? The difference between the two pictures relies on a concept called normalization. Normalization may be a difficult concept to grasp immediately, but you'll see it many times and gain comfort with it. Normalization is the process by which prescription dose is reassigned to a different isodose line in order to change the total dose delivered. So for example, the isodose line in green represents 95% of the prescription dose but it completely covers the intended target. So we tell the computer program that that line should now receive 100% of the dose instead of 95% of the dose. And therefore, the resulting plan covers the entire target with full dose. That means that everything in the plan receives 5% more dose, but it improves the target coverage to be that of the level of the prescription dose. In addition to looking at the graphic plan, you should also look at the dose volume histogram when evaluating coverage on a plan. The dose volume histogram, or DVH, is a graphical representation of the dose delivered to a particular target or tissue. Dose in centigray is displayed on the x-axis, and volume of the target is displayed on the y-axis. A DVH can tell you the maximum or minimum dose delivered to any structure in your plan as well as the dose delivered per unit volume to any structure. Let's look at some examples together. Remember, a good rule of thumb for target volumes is that at least 95% of the target volume should receive at least 95% of prescription dose, though there are variations and exceptions. Here is an example of a dose volume histogram. Again, as a reminder, on the x-axis is the dose on the y-axis is the volume of the tissue. Each colored line on the DBH refers to either a target, like a GTV, CTV, or PTV, or to a normal tissue structure. In order to interpret the DBH, you follow each line to see where the dose and the volume intersect. For example, how much of the target, named CTV45, which is pink and highlighted here in white, is receiving at least 45 gray? If you identify the pink line and follow the 45 gray point along the x-axis to the point that intersects along the pink line, you'll see that nearly 100% of the CTV is receiving 45 gray. Now we move on to the H in CBCHOP, which stands for heterogeneity. Heterogeneity refers to the variability in the dose that's delivered to the target tissue. The goal is to ensure as much uniformity of dose or homogeneity within the target structure as possible. When the dose that's delivered exhibits a high degree of heterogeneity, the areas of high and low dose radiation are often referred to as hot spots and cold spots. Looking at the graphic image of the plan will show you the location of the hot spots and the cold spots. So here we return to the original plan of a patient who's receiving whole breast radiation. The green isodose line that indicates 105% of the prescription dose is higher than the intended dose, and this we would call a hotspot. As a general rule of thumb, when hotspots or cold spots within the target exceed 10% variation from the prescription dose, 
meaning that the dose delivered to a portion of the target is more than 110% of the dose or less than 90% of the intended dose, adjustments to the plan are considered necessary. Hotspots should also never be located in an organ at risk due to concerns for toxicity, and adjustments should be made to the plan to prevent this from happening. This brings us to the next letter in the CBCHAP acronym, Organs at Risk. Evaluating dose to normal tissue structures should involve the review of the same two steps as evaluating coverage to the target. First, looking at the graphic plan, and then reviewing the DVH. Each organ at risk has specific parameters for acceptability that were either previously defined for the dosimetrist or that were derived from Quantech guidelines or other similar metrics. These should be reviewed one by one to ensure that each constraint for each organ at risk is being met by the plan. Here's an example looking at the plan that we saw earlier. Instructions for this plan indicated that no more than 30% of the right lung should receive 20 gray. Or you may see it written as the V20 should be less than 30%. How much of the right lung, which is denoted by a bright yellow line, is receiving 20 gray? If we follow the point at which the 20 gray line intersects with the yellow line, you can see that 15% of the right lung is receiving 20 gray. In addition to dose volume comparisons like we've just made, you might also wish to limit the mean dose to an organ at risk, and this would not be reflected in the DVH, but it can be determined by looking at a table of doses that can also be provided to you by the dosimetrist. Here's an example with different organs at risk and target structures listed along the top columns and different volumetric and mean measurements listed along each row. Instructions for this plan indicated that the mean heart dose should be less than 0.5 gray. In this case, did the planner achieve this metric? Yes, you can see that the D mean of the heart is 0.2 gray, which is lower than the intended instructions. If a particular constraint cannot be met, consider what alterations to the plan would be necessary to ensure safety to the patient. This could include modifying the beam arrangement or treatment technique, accepting a lower amount of target coverage, or accepting a different level or distribution of dose heterogeneity. Knowing when a plan is as optimized as it can be is a very difficult skill, but it is one that you'll slowly learn with time and repeated exposure. The last letter in the CBCHOP acronym stands for prescription. Once the plan is approved, ensure that the prescription dose to each structure and the dose per fraction are entered correctly into the computer. Double check that the type of radiation, the energy of the beams, the delivery method, and the delivery schedule are also recorded correctly. At this final step, it's also important to describe any other special instructions for treatment. This could include the use of a bolus or specific instructions for the patient. Should they be treated with a full or an empty bladder? Do they need the use of a rectal balloon or other modifications in order to deliver the plan as it was designed? All of those instructions should be recorded accurately so that they can be verified when the patient arrives for treatment. So in review, when evaluating a plan, you can use the CBCHOP method as a way to systematically evaluate whether a plan should be approved. This includes reviewing the contours for completion and accuracy, evaluating the beam arrangement and looking through the beam's eye view, making sure that the coverage of target structures are sufficient, checking to make sure that hotspots are not too high and not located in organs at risk, ensuring that the metrics of organs at risk are met, and that the prescription is complete and accurate. 
Now that you have a systematic way to evaluate a plan, you can practice by reviewing a few examples on your own. Please refer to the example test to perform a self-test and ensure that you feel comfortable with the basics of CB CHOP.